in the house of the Lord. All right, everybody. It's good to see y'all. How y'all doing this morning? All right, all right. Let's see. 9.30 on the dot. All right, let's get to the work, y'all. And so um, I just want a uh, few quick announcements. Um, keep the uh, Bork family in prayer. It was the uh, fallen first responder um, who passed away from cancer, his bout with cancer. Um, he was married, had two kids, 26 years old. And uh, his father is a chief, his brother's still an engineer. Josh, a difficult situation to be in. On the next day, ain't that something? Or the Lord, something else, huh? And I want to give a, a, a special birthday shout out as well. I forgot my brother last Sunday, uh, brother Jonas Arsenal had a birthday last week. Want to get a Lord some praise for that? That's another uh, another day in the Lord, another year. And uh, also, we got brother Jimmy and sister Drina Edwards. They're gonna be celebrating 45 years of marriage next week. Man, ain't that something? 45 years, that's a long time. Married to the same person, yeah. That's a, that's a blessing, man. And so it's always a blessing when y'all can just see that happen that way, man. Uh, that gives God glory and honor. And I thank God for it, amen? All right, guys, so if y'all remember, we're in the book of Hebrews, and we were on the series Cross-Eyed just talking about keeping our focus on who? Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12 um, verse 1 reads this way. It says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so this is where we're going to be at this morning. This is, uh, the title of this message is Author and Finisher, or it's Author and Finisher. But y'all, I want to just remind y'all, if you could turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12 for a second. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, 40. Oh, we got it up here for you. And I just want to remind y'all, you know, the whole point of why we're keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ, y'all. Because the scripture makes it clear. Let's look at it. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, right? And in Matthew 12, 40, he says, For Jonah was in three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. It didn't say a well, it was a great fish, right? And it says, So the Son of Man, going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He says, The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. He was talking to the people in Jerusalem at that time. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a what? A greater than Jonah is here. You see that? He said they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but a greater than Jonah is present. Let's, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Matthew 12, verse 40, and uh, 40, 42. 42? Let me see. Man, got 42. Let me get to it. It says, and the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of who? Solomon. And indeed, a what? A greater than Solomon is here. Now this woman done traveled from the ends of the earth. She done came from long and far to hear the wisdom of a man, Solomon, which he got it from God. And if she could travel and do all that to hear the wisdom of Solomon. The Bible says that a greater than Solomon is here. And the greater than Solomon, the greater than Jonah, y'all know who it is? It's Jesus the Christ. And that's the very reason why we keep our eyes on Jesus. Because he greater than Jonah, he greater than Solomon, he greater than Moses, he greater than Abraham, Isaac, Israel, he greater than all. And so this is why we keep our eyes on Jesus, because a greater than all them people is present, and it's Jesus the Christ. Y'all understand? Oh, yeah, I just I had to let you know. I just had to let you know. I wanted to refresh you. Psalm 25, 15, um, if y'all have it, my brothers. I'm going to quote it to y'all for time's sake. I just want y'all to see what the psalmist says. This is in the TLB. He says, my eyes are ever looking to the who? The Lord for help. So he's looking to the Lord for help. For he alone can what? Rescue me. Nobody else. Come, Lord, and show me your mercy, for I am helpless 
overwhelmed, in deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. Oh, save me from them all. See my sorrow, feel my pain, forgive my sins. So you see how the psalmist wrote that? He said, I'm looking to you alone. For you the only one who could rescue me. And so this is why your eyes, this is why your attention, this is why the emphasis of your life, and if you're a preacher, the emphasis of your preaching and your ministry has to be on Jesus Christ because he's the one alone who can rescue the people. And he's the one alone who can forgive the people of their sins. And this is why our attention is on him. I just, I just wanted to bring that back to y'all uh, before we continue. Amen? So let's look at, back at Hebrews 12, man, Hebrews 12. And so author and finisher, this is where we are in the text, y'all. This is where we are. It says that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our feet. So let's talk about it, y'all. Let's talk about what this means, the author. Point number one, author of feet. All right. So when the scripture says somebody is the author of something, this means they're, they're the ones that wrote it. They're the ones that penned it. They're the ones that created it. They're the ones that started this, correct? And so when it says author and finisher of our feet, right now we're on point one talking about author. It's letting us know that Christ Jesus is the one that started this in our lives. That Christ Jesus is the one initiated uh, our salvation, so to speak. That this would not be possible. Any man, any boy, any girl, any person that's saved today, you would not be saved without the author, which is Jesus. This means he's the pioneer. This means he's the captain of your salvation. He's the one that started it, and he's going to be the one that finished it. And so when the scripture says he's the author of our faith, the Bible says, well, well why is he the author? Because the Bible says that none on their own seek after God. The Bible say all we like sheep have gone what, Lewis? We've gone astray and turned to our own way. I'm doing me. I'm doing what I want to do. None of us just come out the womb looking for God. Nobody just come out the womb wanting to be saved. The Bible say we were born in sin and sin. My mother conceived me. And the Bible say that we've all sinned and what? Fallen short of the glory, the standard of God. Nobody come out the womb just talking about, well, let me read the Bible. We're not feeling it. The Bible says we all done went astray, we all turned to our own way, and the Lord laid upon him the sins of us all, Jesus Christ. And so on our own, apart from God, the Bible says none seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. That's what the Psalms say. And so on our own, no man seeks God. The Bible says if you love Jesus, if you love God today, you only love him because he first love you man that's how it go man I'm trying to tell you I'm trying to tell you we only love him now because he loved us first you say well I'm, I'm, I'm pursuing God I'm chasing after God correct you're chasing after God now but it wasn't that way in the beginning you see it's like a spiritual game a, a, a tag you know none of us looking for Jesus none of us trying to be saved none of us seeking him but he come after us and he hit you with that love tag. Look, uh, hit you with that love of God. And he say, tag, you it. And then you start what? You start pursuing him. You see, that's how it happened. But at first, you was not what? You were not feeling Jesus. You was not feeling his word. You were not feeling God. You was not feeling his ways. I know I wasn't. I'm the only one. All right, now tell the truth. Shame the devil. The Bible, I don't want to read no Bible. Man made that to control us. I'm not reading that. That's the foolishness I said before I actually got to know the Lord for myself. Because we say things but never take the time to study it. Never took the time to really dive deep and search it out. But when I searched it out and tasted and saw that the Lord was good, I ain't never went back to the world. You see that? And so you got to understand that on our own, none of us was just going to come after God. That we love him because he first loved us. He came after us. And then we started what? Seeking him. You know, pursue. Come on, bro. You know, it reminds me of an old story, you know what I mean? When I met my wife, you know. Come on, man. What you say, Mike? Don't get me started now. You know, when I first met my wife, you know, it was kind of like how we are with the Lord. She didn't like me too much at first. You know what I'm saying? She didn't like me, man, you know. 
And, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm pursuing her, you know, just like the Lord pursue us. But we don't what? We don't like him. We don't care for him. But the Lord still what? He pursuing us anyway. See, that's that unfair in love. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was pursuing her anyway, but she didn't really, she, didn't, she wasn't trying to give me too much time. But as I kept pursuing and kept pursuing because I said, oh, no, there's it's nothing wrong. The problem not with me, I said. You understand? I said, oh, it's with, it's with her. I said, she only doing that because she never got to know me yet. Oh, come on. I said, but once she gets to know me, Lee, it's over, man. It's over. This, 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 I'm telling y'all what I said to myself now. Now, I was 16 at this time. Now, I just got to let you know. And so, as I kept pursuing her, and kept chasing her down with that, 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 you know, that, that unfailing love, you know. All of a sudden, years later now, it's years, it's years later, because you see love suffer what? It suffer alone. The Lord was chasing me for 21 years before I got saved. And so it was years later, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, then all of a sudden, boom, it's like, it's like she activates. She came to her senses, y'all, the scales fell off her eyes. She once was blind, but now she saw the work of the man standing in front of her. And then, all of a sudden, she started pursuing me. Oh, come on, man. I'm lying, mama. Where my mama at? Oh, you, you hear that? Who that is? Oh, that's Danielle. Oh, that's Danielle for, here for me. So she's pursuing me now. And so that's how it is. Y'all, you see, I loved her just as she was. And I came after her first, but she only loves me now. And she loved me now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I first loved her. And that's the same way it is with Jesus Christ. He loves us first. And then we start loving him. Man, you know, you know, I just, man, I tell you. I just like a good old love story, man. <laughs> and that's what it is, y'all. It's a great love story that the Lord came after us. Why we were sinners. So uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1.21, please, if y'all could give it to me. I'm going to uh, turn there in my Bible just in case, though. 1 Corinthians 1.21. I want to show y'all what the Word of God says. Amen? Because we're talking about Jesus Christ being the author of our faith. So listen to this. We got it up there for y'all. Uh, but turn if you would like. No problem. It says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know who? God. But it pleased God that through the foolishness of the message preach to save those who would do what? Believe. Y'all see that? It says, for the Jews request a sign. And the Greeks, the Greeks is all the other nations besides the Jews. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block because the Jews couldn't fathom a Messiah that would come and be crucified. They wanted a Messiah that was going to come and deliver them from their, their physical bondage to Rome. But Jesus didn't come to handle the physical enemy first. He came to handle the what? Spiritual bondage to sin. So the Jews, it was a stumbling block that he would, the Messiah that they'd been waiting on would, would die on a cross. They couldn't fathom that. So the gospel was a stumbling block to them. But to those who are called both Jew and Greek. So this is both the Jews and the Gentiles. Both called to Christ. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men as well. Now this is a play on words, y'all. The Lord is not foolish ever and he's not weak. But what the text is saying, that even God on his worst day is better than man on his best day. But God, he don't really have no worse days because he's altogether lovely, altogether perfect, altogether wonderful to me and to everybody. He righteous in all his ways, holy in all his works. He never have a bad day. But it's just showing you how greater than man God is, how man never will be and never was on God's level. And so I want you to focus on what the scriptures say. It says that it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who would actually dare to Believe the message that was preached. The gospel, the good news, is not the foolishness of nothing else. God chose that through the foolishness of preaching, he would save those that would believe. And that's why the devil, Satan, always attacks 
preachers and the preaching of the word in the house of God or anywhere else because God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save people who would actually believe the message. It's not through nothing else that a man can be saved. How are they going to preach though unless they are sent by God? And so this is the thing, y'all. God chose to save us if we believe. Now the Bible says that no man can come to me unless the Father draws him, correct? And some people, whether it's my, my Calvinist brothers, because there's two schools of thought. The Calvinists believe that um, it's already decided who's going to be saved and you can't do nothing about it. Either you're one of God's children and that's it. Or it don't matter what you do, what happened. You, you, if you're not one, you're just going to hell. That's it. Either God pick you or he ain't. You don't have no choice in the matter. That's what some believe. And so they say, well, this scripture, he said, no man can come unless the Father draw me. So if he don't draw you, you ain't going to never come. But, but, but you got to use the whole Bible, not just one scripture. This is true. No man can come unless the Father draw him. We only love him because he first loved us. But Jesus also said, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw some men. Uh-uh. He said, I'm going to draw what? All men unto me. So you see, um, whichever school of thought you're on, I'm just going to let both go. You got to remember that God is no respecter of purse. Now, if you save, of course, the election view as far as in uh, that God just pick you and nobody else can be saved. It's just what it is. That sounds good to you if you picked. But if you're not picked or if your child not picked, how that look? It's nothing they could ever do to get saved. It's just what it is. And some have that view. I used to hold that view a long time ago. You know? And so I just want you to understand that Jesus, he said that God chose that the foolishness of preaching to save anybody who decide to what? Believe. It don't matter who you are or what you've done. God will save you if you believe in him. And so God knows those that are his. Don't get me wrong. Now, he know who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. He know who's going to choose him and, and who's going to reject him. But you still have a choice. God not going to tell you to do something and then not give you the ability to do it and then send you to hell for it. That's like telling a man with no arms, clap right now, I'm sending you to hell. Does that match the character of God? That wouldn't be right. And remember, God is no respecter of person. For God to choose you and not choose him for no reason at all to be saved and spend an eternity in hell, it would make God a respecter of person, one which he's not. And then it would make it unjust. And God is not an unjust God. God is holy and righteous in all his ways. Now, there's, now listen, there are believers who save who are split on this uh, matter. And is, is, is fine. But I'm just letting you know, the scripture says that whoever believes the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, rising on the third day bodily for our justification, the Bible says, whosoever call on the name of the Lord, he'll save you. And he is the author of our faith. And he is the finisher of our faith. But the Bible says, whoever believes, that's the one he's going to save. And so if you believe, he'll save you. And I don't want you to let no doctrine or nothing hinder you from believing. If you have faith in Christ, he will save you. But faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. Because at one time I didn't have faith. But as I heard the word, I began to believe. Amen? And so let's look at the text. Now let's keep going. Verse 26 says, For you see your calling, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the what? Foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Here we go. Why did God do this? Why did God choose it to be this way? That no what? No flesh should glory in his presence. Here you go. But... It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Y'all saw that? Did y'all see that? Who became for us wisdom from God and the righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the, in the Lord. So you see, y'all, I showed y'all this verse right here. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3 as well while I'm talking. Just turn to 1 Corinthians 3. I showed you this right here to show you that nobody can take responsibility for your salvation. 
because he is the author of our faith. You follow me? I can't take credit for it. No preacher on the planet could take credit for your salvation because Jesus is the author of your faith. I just showed you the scripture in 1 Corinthians. The Bible says it is because of God that you in Christ Jesus. When it said it's because of him you in Christ Jesus, it's talking about God. He's the reason you in Christ today. He's the reason you saved. He the one who drew you. He the one that loved you. He the one that died for you. And the Bible said it's because of him that you saved today. Yes. And why is that? He said because he don't want no flesh to glory in his presence. So if any man glory, if any man boasts in something, he wants you to boast in glory in the fact that the Lord loved you and gave yourself for you. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But he said, the life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was boasting in the, he was boasting in the Lord, and that's what the Lord wants you to do. So look what 1 Corinthians 3 says. So who then is Paul? Because remember, it's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus. Who is Paul? Or who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe. As the Lord gave each one, I planted, Paul says, Apollos water it. But who? God gave the increase. So then neither is he who planted, he who plants is anything, nor he who waters. But God who gives the what? Increase. Y'all, we could plant something in the ground all day long. Somebody else could come back and water it all day long. But if the Lord don't give the increase, your labor is in vain. That's what the Bible say. The Bible say, unless God keep the city, the soldiers watch in vain. Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. You see, it's God that gives the increase, not me, not the preacher. So if any person is saved on the planet today, God used Paul, God used Apollos. He said, we are ministers through whom you believe. God got to talk to somebody. But let me tell you right now, God don't need no preacher. No. Every preacher on the planet could die today. Me, Tony Evans, TD, we all could just drop it, be gone. And God going to just activate somebody else. Because the Bible said the Lord never left himself without a witness. And if every human being that could preach just so happened to, to go mute one day, the Lord will use a donkey to declare his word to somebody. The Lord don't need us. When he couldn't find a man to stop Balaam, he made the donkey tell him what he wanted to tell. So God don't need us, y'all. And I want you to understand that although God uses pastors, he uses preachers, he uses your mother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your partner to lead you to Christ, to give you the gospel, you do not owe them your salvation. The Bible said it is because of him that you in Christ Jesus, we just ministers through whom you believe. I told you this to you once at Bible study, but some of y'all wasn't here. But I'm going to share it with you again. It's like a man who has a situation, he, he caught on fire. Fire department show up, vroom, they show up in the fire truck, get out, get the hose, take the hose off and open it up, shh, spray the man down, put the fire out, save the man life. The man come out that, oh man, what a, what, a, what a fire truck at, what a fire truck at. He find a fire truck, he find the hose, oh, thank you, hose. Oh, thank you, hose, you saved my life. Oh, hose, you've been so good to me. Oh, and then he hugged the fire hose. Now, the fireman on the nozzle, what you think he think? Man, it wasn't the hose. I'm the one saved your life. I'm the one cracked that thing open and it was maneuvering it the way I needed to be so I could get the fire off. What's wrong with you? But it's the same way in this life. The firemen used the hose to put the fire out, but the man shouldn't have gave the credit, the glory, the praise, the thank you to the hose. He should have gave it to the one that used the hose, correct? Yeah. And it's the same way with us. God is the man. The preacher is the hose. <laughs> and so the Lord just uses us to put the fires out. But at the same time, you don't give the glory to the hose. I'm just a hose. I'm a nozzle. But the Lord is the one working this nozzle to put the flames out. So don't give the glory to me. You got to give the glory to, to the Lord. The Bible say, not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name give glory. And that's how a real man of God, a real Christian should want. Now I'm not saying to treat people like garbage if God used them to help you. But at the same time, 
if I wouldn't have grabbed, if, if God wouldn't have used me to grab the hose and put the fire out, he'd have used somebody else. And so God was going to still get the fire out if he wanted it out. And so the glory go to God. Amen? Amen. And so I just want to let you know, because sometimes people act like you owe them your salvation, and that's not the case. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's, that's the author of our faith. Point number two, finisher of our faith. Somebody say, finisher. Because the Lord, he, he'll finish. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Or we're going to put it up there. Philippians 1. Philippians chapter 1. Mm-hmm. All right. Philippians chapter 1. When y'all get there, say amen. All right. We're going to come start at verse 5. All right. And God, you know, Paul is just thanking God for the Philippian church. He's thanking them for the believers in Philippi. And verse 5 says, I thank God for the fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. But look what he says in verse 6. Because he said they had fellowship in the gospel because they believed the gospel. They got saved, these people. And, and Paul says, I'm being confident of this very thing. Somebody say, be confident. be confident. He's confident of this very thing. What thing? That he, somebody say he, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? The Bible said, he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God is not like people. People start off dealing with you, and then after a while, you might do something that upset them, or they get tired of you, you act, and they say, man, I'm done with you. Don't call me no more. Don't text me no more. I'm through with you. I'm through with you. That's what they say. But the Lord not like me. The Bible says God is faithful to finish what he starts. And that's a characteristic of God that you got to love, his faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sand, I'm going to praise your name. Songwriter said, great is your faithfulness to me. And the Lord faithful. He don't start saving a man and then stop saving a man. The Lord knew David was going to kill Uriah and sleep with Bathsheba before he starts saving and he started saving him anyway, Lee, because the Lord knows everything you're going to do, every sin you're going to ever do, and the Lord still loves you the same anyway. And the Lord not going to start saving you and then give up on you like that. Y'all follow what I'm saying? The Bible said God is faithful to finish what he started. He said when the Lord saves you that nobody can pluck you out of his hand. No man, and that includes you. That includes yourself. Nobody can pluck you out of my hand. He said, none can pluck you out of my father's hands. My father is greater than all. And he says, he and his father are, he greater than all as well. And so he said, you can't stop him. I can't stop him. None of us can stop. He said, can't no devil in hell pluck you out of his hands. If the Lord start, if the Lord began to work. Because there is such a thing as a false conversion. Where you think the Lord started to work and the Lord never started to work. That's just religion. But if the Lord really started saving you. If you're really born again, once you become born again, you can't become unborn again. And so God is faithful to finish what he started. And so when the Bible says he's the author, the, the starter, and he the finisher of your faith, that's what it means. The Lord will save you. The Bible says he who began a good work in you will complete it, will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. Until Jesus Christ come back the second time, the Lord will not give up on working on one of his children. And so... I wanted you to see that. <laughs> I wanted you to see that. Now, now we're in Philippians chapter 1, correct? But let's look at Philippians chapter 2, since you're right there. Now, some people think, well, since Jesus is the author and the finisher of the faith, well, shoot, I, I ain't got to do nothing. Jesus is just going to do it all. Jesus is the author. He's the finisher. He's the captain. He's the pioneer of my salvation. Well, I'm going to just lay down. I'm going to just chill. Uh-uh. Right. That's not Bible either, now. You got to know the whole counsel of God. So look what the scriptures say in the same book. Paul didn't want them to be confused. Philippians chapter 2, y'all there? Verse 12, look what he say. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, I want you to know that Paul letting them know, I'm not going to be there with you. I'm not going to be there to hold your hand, Paul letting them know. Y'all got the gospel, y'all saved now? Look what he tells them. He says, work out. Somebody say, work out. Your own salvation with fear and trembling. Y'all see that? Y'all see? So, so, nothing wrong with a good workout. 
Some of us, we don't like to work out. But the Lord says it's something he wants you to work out. It's not just your body, because bodily exercise profit little, but God and his profit for all things. This life and the one to come. But he wants you to work out your own salvation. Now, you can't work out the next person's salvation, although people try. You got to work out your own salvation. The Bible says make your calling and election sure. Examine yourself whether you're in the faith. But the Bible says you got to work out your own salvation. Now, the Bible says we save by grace through faith, not works, lest any man should boast. Right? It's the gift of God. So God saves a man for free. But after he saves you for free, the Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God preordained that we should walk in. Y'all, it's just like if you join the army. You join the army for what? For free. You don't have to pay them to sign up. They're going to take you, correct? Now, there's some qualifications you got to meet. Just like getting saved is some qualifications you got to meet as well. You got to be able to admit that you are a sinner. Because Jesus didn't come to save nobody but sinners. He said, I ain't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So if you think you're righteous already, which you're really not, that self-righteousness and pride, then Jesus ain't come for you. Jesus only came for people who can admit that they some sinners. And so that's the qualification. Once you can admit that you're a sinner, and then you also have to believe in Jesus Christ. Believe that he came, born of a virgin. Live that sinless life that none of us could live. Died a substitutionary death on the cross. His death was vicarious. He took our place. And then rose with a, with a glorified body, one that you could touch, one that could eat food, walk through walls, and then ascend into heaven. And he left us with the promise that whosoever believe in him, that he is not a way, but the only way, you will be saved. But you got to call on him in truth, being willing to depart from a lifestyle of sin and to live for him. But he's going to give you the power and grace to do it. When you, when, you, when you meet them qualifications of faith and a, being able to humble yourself and admit that you fall short of the glory, God's going to save you for free. And it's the same way the military will take you in for free. But after they take you in for free, you got to start working out, huh? Oh, yeah, man, you can't stay scrawny forever. They're going to put you in that gym. They're going to make you run. They're going to make you start working out. And so it's the same way with Christ. He'll save you for free. But then you got to start working out your own salvation. And this requires the effort that it takes in a, believer, a believer's life, y'all. Jesus, although he's the author and finisher of the faith, he's not about to drop down from heaven, pick your hand up, make you open the Bible, open up your eyelids, hold it open for you, and make you read your Bible. He's not making you do none of that. The Bible says you got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, respect, reverence for God. Y'all, y'all follow me? The Bible call it fighting the good fight of what? Faith. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold to eternal life, which you will call. He wouldn't call it fighting a good fight of faith if he was just going to do everything for you. He would say, watch the good fight of faith. I'm about to do it all for you. Just sit back and watch it. No, he didn't say watch the good fight of faith. He said, fight the good fight of faith. And we don't fight our battles wrestling with flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual and mighty through God. They're not carnal, no. Our weapons of prayer, our weapons are the word of God. It is written. The shield of faith, these are our weapons, but it's it's things that you have to do. The Bible says resist the devil and he's going to flee from you. You got to resist. The Bible says flee youthful lust, flee fornication. There's some things that you have to do. He says study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God not going to do it all for you. Some things that you and I have to do to be saved. And so I mean, after he saves you, he saves you for free, but you, there's some things you got to do for your sanctification process. But the Bible says don't get proud because when you keep reading Philippians, he says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Correct? Y'all there? Verse 13 says, for it is who? God who works in you both to will and to do his good, his good pleasure. And so it's not that God telling you to do this and you're doing it by yourself. Jesus said it is expedient that I go back to heaven because I'm going to send to you the what? The comforter. Another just like himself. God, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. The one that comes alongside you and assists you. But not just come alongside you. He come live on the 
inside of you and energizes you, empowers you to do his will. God not going to tell you to do something and then not give you the supernatural grace, strength, and power to do it. The Bible not going to say, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and then make it an impossibility. You're not going to say, wives, submit to your own husband and then make it to where it's impossible for you to do it. God not like that. He's not trying to set you up for failure. God is trying to set you up for success. When the Lord tells you to do something, he gives you the grace, he gives you the power through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit to fulfill his will for your lives. And so you got to work out your own salvation, but remember that it's God with you, in you, willing you, changing your desires, making you hate the sin that you used to love, willing you to do his good pleasure. We all can remember if you're saved today that there were sins that you used to love to do that you hate that thing. You ashamed to even really, really. You only bring it up for testimony purposes to give God glory, but you don't even really like to talk about that. Thing. Now, you're going to talk about it to help others relate to where you've been and to give God the praise so they can see that you always wasn't this way, but at the same time, you don't even love it no more. But what happened? It was God in you, willing you, and causing you to do his good pleasure. He changed them desires. He changed them, them greedy ways. He changed them womanizing ways. He changed your desires. He can do it, y'all. Is, is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. And so the same way God changed me, the same way he changed many of y'all in here, the same way he changed Paul who was persecuting the church, the Lord can change any man, any woman that comes to him. And Jesus said, if anybody come to me, I'm in no wise cast in my And so I want y'all to understand that salvation is a gift from God. And he is the author and finisher of your faith. But at the same time, it does require effort on our part. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. He said, there's things that we have to do. You got to work. You got to resist. You got to fight. You got to pray without ceasing. You have to be a witness for Christ. It's things you got to do. You will not grow spiritually if you're not working out your own salvation. Your marriage is not going to prosper if you're not working out your own salvation. Your children are not going to grow in godliness if you're not working out your own salvation. And just like physical working out, God bless the truth, it's difficult sometimes, it's hard, it's pain in it, it's, it's, it's soreness, it's aches, it's I feel the burn. But sometimes in living for Christ, you're going to have to feel the burn. Paul never escaped living for Jesus without any scars. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He went through some things for living for Christ because he was working out his own salvation. The Bible said we're not tricking y'all either. Paul said, I already told you that through much tribulation, we got to enter the kingdom of God. Man, I'm telling you, man. So listen, we got to work out our own salvation. What you say, D? You know about that. And so, now, now be careful. You say, work out your own now. Some people busy trying to work out somebody else when so much that theirs messed up. It's like the man who went working out with his friend. His friend was not in as good a shape as he was. So he was kind of in shape, but his friend wasn't in as good shape as he was. They went to the gym together. His friend telling him, look, all right, I need you to get on the ab machine and start doing this. All right, I need you to get on the curl machine and start doing this. Now I need you on the treadmill start doing this. Now I need you on the shoulder doing this. He bringing them from machine to machine, day after day, week after week. When some months pass, you look. His friend looking better than him. Uh oh, what happened? He was so busy working out his friend that he forgot to work out his own self. Man, come on, man. And they got some Christians like that. They so busy trying to work out their husband, so busy trying to work out their wife, so busy trying to work out their children, so busy trying to work out their friend, or their friend of their friend, or, or this one or that one, that they forget to look in the mirror for themselves. Woo! Don't let that be you. The Bible says you got to work out your what? Own self. Now, after you work out your own, then you can help somebody. Out. But make sure you work out your own salvation first. Amen? Man, thank you, Lord. Oh, we moving. We moving. Oh, it's 10 10. Where you been? Let's see. All right. We must. Okay, okay. Next point, point number three for joy. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It says in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Point number three, for the joy that was set before him. And so I want y'all to understand what happened with Jesus Christ. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, 3. And that's where we're going to start at, Hebrews 1, 3. Y'all, the Bible said for the joy that was set before Jesus, he was able to endure the cross, y'all. For the joy that was set before him, he was able to endure the cross. Meaning that Jesus Christ was focused on the joy that would come later on that he was able to endure the pain and suffering that he was currently going through on the cross of Calvary. God bless the truth. He was able to delay gratification. Somebody say delay gratification. And he was able to delay gratification, delay the joys of being back in heaven, back in his glorified body, restoring the glory that he once had before the beginning of time. Because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Word became flesh. The Bible say that the Son was given, he was sent, he always existed. And so he, he, he was waiting to be restored back to his former glory, glorified body, to be back in heaven. The Bible say in heaven at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Y'all understand? But he was not, uh, he was not uh, impatient. He was able to delay that for us. He endured the cross. He endured the hard time. He endured being slapped, spit, nailed to the cross because of the joy that would come what? Later on. And so he is an example for us of how we are to be. But what was the joy that came later? Was it just him being uh, back in heaven? Uh-uh. It was joy because of what he was accomplishing. You know when you're doing something, you, you are able to go through it because you know when you finish what you have accomplished. So let me show you. Hebrews 1.3 says, talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory. Talking about he's the brightness of God's glory. He is the express image of his person. Meaning uh, whenever you uh, copy money, they use something, uh, a mint stamp, and it's the exact image that's on the dollar, the exact image that's on the coin. Christ is the exact image of God. Very God. He is the express image of, of his person, and he upholds all things together by the word of his power. Y'all see that? When he had by himself, somebody say by himself, by himself, by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And so this is what I want you to see. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. The Bible said when he had by himself purged our sins. Y'all see that? What did he accomplish at the cross? What was something that he was so happy about? What was the joy that was set before him? One of the things that was the joy set before him that he was happy to do. He was glad. He endured the pain because he knew he would accomplish purging our sins. But I want you to understand when it says he purged our sins, it says when he had by himself purged our sins. Nobody helped Jesus as far as when he purged our sins. I'm not talking about Simon helping him carry the cross. That's not what purged our sins, them carrying the cross. It was his sinless death. That's what purged our sins. Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. It was the sinless life that he lived. Nobody helped him with that. The Bible say by himself purged our sins. Mary didn't help him purge our sins. Paul, Peter, James, John, Joseph Smith, Henry Clifford Kinley, none of your favorite pastors. I didn't help him. Nobody helped him purge our sins. The Bible says he purged our sins by himself. And even if somebody wanted to try to assist, they wouldn't be qualified to attempt. Because they are sinner also. You need a sinless sacrifice to purge these sins. And he is the only way in the only truth, the only life, he is the only one who was qualified to die for our sins. On our behalf, he is the only offering, the only sacrifice that God the Father would accept as payment for our sins. The Bible say he by himself purged our sins. Purged, cleansed us, y'all. Cleansed us of sin by himself. 
Nobody else get the glory. Nobody else even get half a fraction of the credit. He did this by himself. You know when you do something by yourself in school? Y'all had a little group project in the class, and you know they always put somebody with you who don't do nothing in the group? I was the one who didn't do nothing. So you know. <laughs> No, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. But it's just to say they put somebody with you who don't really help. Then y'all get an old 180. See, oh, good job, guys. And you thinking, man, it didn't help. I did that all by my. Come on now. You don't want nobody else getting credit for what you did by yourself. And neither does God. He said his glory he's not going to share with. No man, no woman, neither will his praise go to graven images because a statue ain't died for your sins. A man besides the God man, Jesus Christ, didn't die for your sins. It was Jesus Christ alone, y'all. So you got to remember, a pastor ain't died for your sins. Jesus purged our sins by himself, the scriptures say. Oh, yeah, I know that. Sometimes we know it, but we don't act like it. You could say you know it, but are you acting like he the only one died for your sins? We got to act like it. And we got to believe it. Amen? And so I want you to see, this is one of the joys that he was able to, to look at. That's why he was able to endure them slapping him, beating him whipping him, nailing him to the cross, all that. He was able to endure that because he knew that when he completed his mission, it is finished that he had bought, purchased the salvation for all mankind. Black, white, Asian, Latino, it don't matter what y'all, Israelite. He done died for everybody. The last sin that the last human being going to ever commit, the last human going to be born, he done died for all that. And he knew once he Went through what he had to go through. Look at what the look all the good that was gonna come out of this. Look at all the greatness that's gonna come out of this. I'ma purge all these sins whenever I go through what I gotta go through. He said it's worth it. Because I love him that much. He said, look, look, it is finished. Not it's almost finished, it's finished at the cross. Jesus paid it all. Amen. Amen. And so that was one of the things. And so, and then being back in glory, of course. That's, 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 that was one as well. But I want y'all to see Jesus as our example. We have to do what Jesus did. For the joy that's set before us, we have to endure the things that we go through. Because in this world, you will have trouble. I will have trouble. The Bible says that this world going to hate you. And Jesus said, if the world hated you, remember it hated me first. But be of good cheer, Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And we can also overcome the world with our faith in Jesus, in him. And so I want you to know, I'm not trying to set you up for a fairy tale, cotton candy, Christianity. The Bible warns us that we're going to have trouble. But at the same time, he says, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, well, people can tell you to endure hardship, but how, pastor? How do I endure hardship? You do what Jesus did, and you set your eyes on the joy that's set before you. You think about what's going to happen later. You think about what you're going to get after this life. You have to have your eyes and your mind set on things above where Christ is seated. And so what's something that I can think about? You can do what Jesus did for the joy that is set before the Christian. You can think about the joys of heaven. Somebody say the joys of heaven. Mm, turn your Bibles to Revelations chapter 7 as we talk about the joys of heaven. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's look at it. We're going to put it up there for you, but you can still turn that. It's important to turn. You know, Revelation chapter 7. So we got to do like Jesus. And for the joy that is set before us, we got to look at it and talk about what's going to happen. Somebody say heaven. heaven. All right. Revelation chapter 7, verse 16. When you get there, say amen. amen. And look, we have it up there. It says, they shall neither hunger anymore, nor what? Thirst. Anymore, the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Mm, mm, mm. Man, I don't even have to really break it down, huh? Oh, no, but I'm breaking it down. We got, I'm going to break it down. <laughs> I'm going to break it down. Now, listen, um, I'm going to leave, y'all can leave this verse up here. Y'all turn to Revelation 21 while I break down the one I just read, all right? Turn to Revelation 21 while I break down. Now, he said that it's going to be uh, no hunger, no thirst. Y'all, 
Everybody who's suffering on the planet and dying of starvation, he said, that's over. We're not going to hunger no more. You're not going to go to bed uh, uh, stomach hurting. You're not going to see the little kids whose stomach's big because they're malnourished. He said, in heaven, there's no hunger no more. There's nobody living talking about they can't get water, they can't get something to drink. There's no thirst no more either. And it's no spiritual hunger or spiritual thirst either because he said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. And when you get to heaven, you're going to be filled like you've never been filled before. So there's no more natural hunger in heaven and there's no more spiritual hunger or thirst in heaven as well. So he said, you're not even going to have to worry about the elements striking you. It says the sun not going to strike them nor any heat. So can I get an amen? No more humidity. Perfect weather in heaven. No more humidity. Your head not going to mess up, sister, after you put them curls and go out there. You're going to come out your room in heaven, your head going to stay the same. Lord, ain't that so? And so there's no humidity in heaven as far as in no bad weather. I don't know how it's going to be. You know, secret things belong to God. But it's going to be somehow to where the, the element's not going to be a problem. You're not going to be in heaven talking about, oh, man, can somebody uh, turn the AC down or turn it up? Oh, man, it's hot today in heaven. Uh-uh. The Bible said that the glory of Jesus is going to be lighting up heaven. You ain't even going to need no sun. The S-O-N going to shine on us. And so it's not going to be no problems with the elements as well. But I also want you to understand, it says that the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them. We're not going to have to worry about bad leadership in heaven. Whether it's bad leadership in your household, you're not going to have a bad father over you. You're not going to have a bad mother over you. You're not going to have a bad husband over you. You're not going to have nobody bad over you in leadership. And even if it's in churches, you're not going to have bad pastors trying to fleece the flock and twist the scriptures and manipulate people. You're not going to have nobody running game in heaven. It's no bad leadership. You're not going to have bad political leaders trying to take advantage of the people, take advantage of the resources in the city where they build up one side and leave another side in despair. You're not going to have bad politicians, whether it be governors, mayors, or senators, state representatives. You're not going to have all the corruption in leadership. The Bible say that the lamb going to shepherd and lead his people. You're going to have the best leadership possible. God Almighty, it's not going to be no wars from Putin attacking this place. It's not going to be people invading this place for money. It's not going to be none of that. No racism in the politics. No racism and, and just respect to a person in the leadership is not going to be none of that. The Bible says God going to be a fair and just leader in heaven. Bad leadership going to be over with when we get to heaven. Man, ain't that a blessing? You know how many problems on earth stem from bad leadership? Whether it be political, spiritual, or in the family, most all problems stem from corrupt or bad leadership. Whether it's in the household, with the parents, whether it's in the church, with the leadership, whether it's in the country, or in, it's, it's bad leadership. The Bible says in heaven, you don't have to worry about no bad leadership. Because you got the best leader there ever will be, ever was, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He going to be our leader. He going to guide us. He going to shepherd us. It's going to be complete equity, complete fairness. Going to be the best leader there. Like, oh, you're going to be running to be up under him. No respect of person. No favoritism. No sin at all in it. Amen? But now let's look back at Revelation 21. Y'all there? See, I had y'all go there ahead of me. Oh, yeah, yeah, Revelation 21. We got it up there? Let me see. I told y'all, 21, huh? That's what I said? Uh -huh. Verse 3. All right, come on. There we go. Oh, y'all in there. It says, and I heard... A loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. God himself is going to be with us, it says, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4, and God will wipe away every what? Every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more what? Death, sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more what? Pain for the former things have passed away. Now, now, now you see that? So listen, y'all, one, the Bible says it's going to be no more pain. Somebody say no pain. When we get to heaven, if you're a believer in Christ, he said it's going to be no pain, y'all. No arthritis. No pain from a past injury. No diabetes. No high blood pressure. No headaches. No back aches. No foot aches. No onions, bunions, or corns. Nothing going to be wrong. 
I'm telling you, yeah, grab your bunion if you got to. Do what you got to do. But it's not going to be no pain in heaven. And whether that's physical pain, but it's saying no sorrow as well. So it's not going to be pain from losing a love. Pain from loss of a child. Pain from loss of a brother. Pain from loss of a mother or father. It's going to be no more sorrow or pain in heaven. He said he's going to wipe away every tear. You're not even going to have a reason to cry no more. It's no pain, no sorrow when you get to heaven. I'm talking there's going to be no more frustration with the things of life. No sorrow because of how this one treating you and not treating you right. No pain from your heart being broken because somebody betrayed you, backstab you, step on your heart. You're being good to people, they're being bad. No pain, no sorrow, no reason to shed a tear in heaven. This is what heaven is like. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before Christ, he endured the cross. You got to be able to endure some things in this life, but you got to keep your mind cross-eyed. You got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You got to keep your mind stayed on heaven. The Bible says set your affections on things above where Christ is seated for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And if your mind is really set on these things, if you're thinking on things that's praiseworthy, things that's good, you're not going to be stressing like some of us stressing. When you think about my present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed that is to come. You're not going to be worried like you're worried. You're not going to be mad like you're mad when you think about it. Do you really believe the scriptures? Do you really believe that you're going to a place where there's no pain, no sorrow, no crying, no more drama? No marriage, I'm just saying, no drama. No more drama. You're not going to have to worry about, what what the police doing outside? Oh, they call the laws again. Oh, where my child? You ain't got to worry about none of that. He says, no drama in heaven. No stressing in heaven. No diabetes, none of that. Any sickness you could think. No cancer in heaven. Taking away your love. It's none of that. The Bible says the former things are passed away. Behold, the Lord make it all things new. That's what the word says. And so you see the joys of heaven? Man, that's the joy of it. I want you to understand. It's not just the joy of the things that's in heaven, the peace that's in heaven, the pleasures at his right hand that's forevermore. The Bible says that God himself is going to be our God. The Bible says, who do I have in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth I desire more than you or beside thee. You see, God is our exceeding great reward like he told Abraham. All those things I named, that's fine, that's cool, that's lovely, but at the same time if all that stuff was there and God wasn't there, then I don't want to go. But all those things are only there because God is there. <laughs> you understand? That's the only reason. These are, are, are benefits from God being there, from being in his presence. Y'all follow me? Like Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. God is the greatest reward that you're going to get. We already have him. Yeah, we already have him, but we don't have him in his fullness like that. You know, like he said, when I get to heaven, we're going to see him face to face, and I'm going to know him like I am fully known. And so when we get to heaven, God is going to be there. Your creator going to be there. You get to meet your Savior. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yeah. And so that's, that's the glory. That's the benefits. That's the things that you got to set your mind on when you're going through hard times, when you're going through trials, when nobody understands you, when people just, just treating you bad. You got to do like Jesus for the joy that set before me. I'm enduring it all. Because I believe the scriptures. Now, if you really don't believe these things, that might be why you're having trouble keeping your jaw. But I want you to understand, this is not for everybody. I want you to look. We stopped at verse 5, right? Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write these words true and faithful. Verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the what? Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely, see, freely, to him who thirsts. Verse 7, he who overcomes, you see that? He who overcomes is taking effort. You got to have done fought the good fight of faith in Jesus Christ. He who overcomes by faith, not by works, shall inherit all things. But you're going to show your faith by your works. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son or my daughter. But verse 8, here it go. Somebody say, but. Oh, because you see, you thought all that, no joy, I mean, unspeakable joy, no pain, no sickness, no sorrow. You thought God just giving that to everybody, people who not even serving him, who never even called on Jesus to be saved? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. 
You think you're getting perfect bliss? You think you're getting all that and you ain't even come to him? Uh-uh. God says, but the cowardly. Somebody say the cowardly. The unbelieving. The abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars. Because you see, we hard on the murderer and the homosexual and the pedophile and the this one and the that one, but you lying all the time. The Bible is the only sin he said, but all, he didn't say all murderers, all, he said, but all liars. You see how bad lying is to God? The Bible say the devil is a liar. The Bible says six sins God hates, seven in abomination, two of the seven that he hates is lying. Lying. He said, but all liars shall have their part in heaven, uh uh-uh, in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Because it's appointed for man to die once, then after that, the judgment, he going to judge it and cast you in the lake of fire for all eternity. There's no such thing as annihilation where you just get pulverized and cease to exist. That would be nice. People wish that was the case. Uh Uh-uh. I don't know how it's going to happen or how it's going to be, but the Bible says somehow you're going to have a body fit for eternal suffering forever. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I don't want to know. Tell me about it. I don't want to know. But you're not going to be able to because I'm going to be with the Lord. Because he said a cowardly. You see, they got people who cowards. They scared to live for Jesus, and they worried about what everybody else think, and so they refuse to come to Christ because oh, I don't, what they gonna say, what this one gonna think, they gonna stop talking to me, they gonna stop, they gonna stop. He says, but the cowardly, not gonna be able to get this. The cowardly, the one who said, I don't want to stand up for Christ, I'm gonna just deny him in front of everybody. Jesus said, if you're scared to profess me before men, if you deny me before men, before this sinful and adulterous generation, I'm going to deny you before the Father and before the angels on judgment day. I'm going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. That's what the words say. He said, but the cowardly, because sometimes we let the cowards get a pass. Oh, she was just scared. Oh, they was just scared. God said in the last book of his Bible, but the cowardly. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man chasing them. Look, we all scared at times here. The Bible says at times when I'm afraid, I'm going to trust in you. The problem is when you let your fear cause you to sin against God, deny God, not stand up and do what's right by God. That's when that cowardness is overtaking you. And now you in sin because the fear of man, the cowardice of man work at a snare. It's a trap. And it ain't from God. And so he said, but the cowardly, and this is people who continuously operate in these things, y'all. We've all been all of these things possibly on this list right here. Y'all got it? And so he said, but the cowardly, the unbelieving. Who, who hasn't been unbelieving before? We've all been unbelieving before. But this is a person who abides in, continues in unbelief in Jesus the Christ. The unbelieving. Oh, oh, all they got to be is unbelieving? That's all you got to be. If you're just unbelieving in Jesus, you can have all 4.0 your whole life, all the way till you get your doctorate doctorate degree, all A's, never made a B, never been to jail, never got a speeding ticket, parking ticket. You done walk old ladies across, you done donated food, you done done all these good deeds and good works, but if you're just unbelieving in Jesus Christ, you're going to bust hell wide open too. Because although you've never done certain things, you still have done other things that offended God. And, and that self-righteous pride where you think you're better than the murderer, better than the drug dealer, better than the homosexual, better than the pedophile, that's pride and sin by itself. In one sin disqualifies us all from heaven. Adam disobeyed God one time and got kicked out the God. So nobody better than nobody. Unbelief, truth be told, is the main sin that sent people to hell. Because God will forgive lying, stealing, murder. He forgive all that. You're going to see liars, thieves, jackpot. You can see he stole my alternator. He's going to be in heaven. And if you stay unbelieving, you won't. The unbelief in Jesus Christ is what send men to hell more than anything. Because it's the only sin he can't forgive. You're refusing to come to Jesus. You're refusing to believe in him. He said the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderer, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolater, and all liars will have their part with burning lake of fire. So this joy that's set before us is not for everybody, y'all. It's for those who come to Jesus Christ admitting that 
we sin and fall short of the glory. And so, which category are you in? Which category are y'all in? Because you see, I can't see inside your heart, but the Lord sees all things. And whether you're here in person or watching from the live stream, the Lord sees you. And he see everything you do. He see the good, the bad, the ugly. And let me tell you, he have a problem with the sin. He hate the sin, but he still love you. And he died for you, rules for you. He wants you to come to him. No matter what you've done, you can start today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. But you got to choose this day who you're going to serve. You got to be willing to work out your own salvation after the Lord save you for free. It's some things that the Lord will require of you. But he's going to give you the grace and he's going to give you the strength to do the things that he needs you to do. But for the joy that's set before you, the glories and the wonders of heaven, the glory of being in the presence of your Savior, it, it, you got to keep that in mind. It's worth it. It's worth it, yo. It's worth getting saved. It's worth getting filled with peace that pass understanding, unspeakable joy. It's really worth it. This is not an offer that God is making to you that's not worth that. It's worth that and then some. Actually, you're getting a better deal than him. <laughs> the Lord don't get nothing for saving us. He's still God whether we all go to hell or not. He's still worthy of the praise. The angel's still bowing down. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Y'all, he didn't add nothing to himself by saving us. No. He doing us a favor. The Bible says it is because of his great mercy which he loved us. So you got to understand that if you're not saved, the glories of heaven going to pass you by. And whatever sin that's between you and God, that's what's going to be responsible for sending you to hell. Now for the Christian, you can be happy, you can be joyful, you can endure the things that you will go through in this world by keeping your mind set on the joys of heaven. I know we hear about hell a lot, but you got to think about heaven. You got to think about your Savior. You got to think about the joys that you're going to get for enduring this hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Bible say that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. The Lord going to reward you for everything you suffered, everything that you took, everything that you didn't partake in because you was doing it for his glory and his name's sake. God going to reward you, man. I'm telling you. And so you can rejoice in that, and you should have that at the forefront of your mind. I think about it daily. I want my reward. And the Bible says, see to it that no man or woman cause you to lose your reward. So listen. We, we conclude, my Bible closed with this. If you're a Christian today, I want you to leave this place thinking about the joys of heaven. Man, I didn't realize there's going to be no pain, no this, no that, no that. But most importantly, Christ is going to be with you. Remember these things when you're down. Remember these things when the enemy try to make depression come upon you. The joys of heaven, just tell the devil, man, it is written. <laughs> no pain. Yeah, my arm hurting right now, but it's going to be no pain in a little bit. You see, you got you to gotta, don't complain. Think about the joys of heaven. And so if you're lost today and you don't know Christ, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I done shared the gospel with you. You got to be able to turn from sin to Jesus Christ, and he's going to give you the power to do it. But you got to decide. It, look, look. You got to ask. So pray with me. But you got to mean this for yourself. If you don't mean what you're asking God, nothing going to happen. But if you mean it, even from a child, he'll save you and use you for his glory. And Christ will be yours most importantly, but as well as the joys of heaven. Say, Lord Jesus, save me, a sinner. Forgive me of all my sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins. Teach me your ways. Be my Lord. Be my God. Take my mind 
and set my affection on things above and not things of the earth. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the grace to turn from sin and to turn to your will. Make me a soul winner for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 hallelujah. Man, listen, listen, listen. Man, the Lord loves us, y'all, and there's benefits for serving Christ. Don't think that we're going to turn away from all that and God ain't going to give you nothing. Nah, man, it's rewards for serving God, amen? So I want you to just be thinking about the joys of heaven today if you are a believer in Christ. And if you're not, I want you to think about the, the, the pain and agony of the lake of fire if you're not. And I want you to turn from that. And think about how much Jesus loved you to where he died for you and turned from you. It's never too late to come back and say, I done come to my senses. Lord, save me a sinner. Call on the Lord if you don't know. Amen? Amen. Bible study going to be this Thursday at 630. If you're free, we'd love to have you. Um, please keep the, uh, the family of Brother Paul in prayer. Our brother had a quadruple bypass surgery um, last week. And they changed a the valve in his heart. He made it through. Praise God. And uh, yes, Lord. And so if our brother watching, we want to keep our brother in prayer and pray our brother all the way till he back in here sitting back there right there. You understand? And so uh, y'all keep our brother in prayer. That's a major operation, a major surgery. The Lord has brought him out. Um, but we want him to continuously bring him back to us. Amen. All right, y'all. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for your people sitting under your word with great patience. Bless this here, your people, with a great day, with more understanding when they read your Bible. Give them more fruit. Help them to make time to abide and spend time with you in prayer and in the scriptures. Give them the desires of their heart that line up with your will for their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love y'all, man. <laughs>